black bone, and they should have a funny bone. So this is your chance to exercise your funny bone. Uh, the, I, I'm going to introduce all this stuff, and it's going to tie into the sermon, the, the tense. And these are three jokes about camping. All right, so the, the first one uh, goes like this. This guy uh, goes into a psychiatrist. This guy goes into a psychiatrist, and, and he says, uh, Doctor, I think I am a canvas camping tent. No, 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 I think I'm a teepee. No, 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 I'm a camping tent. No, I'm a teepee. No, no, I think I'm a camping tent. And the, and the doctor says, no, I, I think I understand your problem. You're too tense. <laughs> all right, all right, so number two, so then, um, uh, yeah, some of you are not just kidding, okay? So the Lone Ranger and his companion Tonto, right, they're out camping, uh, you know, out in the wilderness here camping, and they have a canvas tent, all right, so they're camping, and the strong wind comes up, and uh, the night blows it off, and uh, Lone Ranger wakes up, and he says, Tonto, I don't think we're in canvas anymore. <laughs> all right, all right, some of you do have a funny bone, some of you don't. Some of you don't have any funny bone. All right, so third and final punishment for the day. Third and final, I joke for the day. Um, I had to do camping, all right. Uh, there are these two skunks, and they're out in the woods, and they see this hunter uh, make his way through the woods with a rifle. And the first skunk says, Wow, look at that hunter over there with a rifle. I hope he doesn't shoot us. And the second skunk bows its head and says, Let us spray. <laughs> okay. That's funny. That's the best one. That was the best of the three. Save the best for last, right? Alright. So uh, I told you more punishment. That's, that's true. Um, so I, I want to talk about a very important scripture today, but I, I like to use visual aids, and I want to have the five points of today be symbolized by uh, steaks, or uh, these are uh, spikes that you would use to hold down a tent. So tents, they need steaks in order to hold them down and keep them stable from strong winds blowing them away. Now, my family and I we used to do a lot of uh, camping, tent camping on our uh, camp, on our uh, vacations. And one time we went to Joshua Tree National Park, and we're camping out there. And then the winds were coming up, and the, the morning we decided, you know, it's time to go. And so we're packing up the car, and we moved all the stuff out of the tents into the car. And this wind just ripped the tent right up. And it just started tumbling, like a tumbleweed, just boom, 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 boom. And so we're running after it, and it hit this 20-foot high uh, uh, rock. And then the wind hit the rock, too, right? It blew the tent right up and over the rock. Boom, just right up and over. And so we're all scrambling. There's a lot of, oh, I'm in the tent. The kids are running. Now, you remember that? Remember that time? That's, yeah, it was fun, wasn't it? So we're running after the tent. So, so uh, see, normally uh, tents need to have sticks. They need to be Take down and you stake them down into a nice grass area like that, and that's an, an average normal tent. And uh, that's kind of what happened to our tent. Now I, I, I found this picture in Germany. There is a music festival, and uh, a tornado came through. Look at that. Those are all tents. The tornado just picked them up and choose, brought them into the sky. So uh, the, the reason why I'm, I'm talking about this is because in our in our Christian lives. We might have these beliefs. Uh, we're Christians. We believe in God. And uh, yeah, we're good people. But there are some teachings that unless you really stake them into your thoughts, unless you really believe them and grab hold of them, you're going to be like a person who's blown here and there by the culture. I mean, whatever trend comes along, you're just going to follow it. You know, whatever persuasive protester or politician there is, and they just get you riled up, and whatever news event it is, whatever advertisement it is, just going to roll along and, and go that direction, wherever the wind's blowing. But with these truths that you're going to learn today from Jesus, it's like staking down a tent. It's like putting these stakes into the ground, and you're going to be uh, solid. You're going to know that I don't have to solve all the nation's problems. I don't have to solve all the world's problems. 
I just have to listen to the master. If I listen to the master and obey his orders, I know who I am and I know what I'm supposed to do. So these stakes are going to hold down your Christian faith and, and they're going to be uh, for mature, this is a, a message for mature Christians. And this is something I feel is very important to, to learn and to hear in our society today. So we're going to read this passage and uh, I'd like us to read it together. Oh yeah, this is, I always like to have a phrase that you can go home with, something that I repeat throughout the, the sermon so that you can uh, remember it. And so I, I saw this uh, quote, the saying, and I thought, oh, that's cool, I like that. We can't be lions until we've been lambs. We can't be lions until we've been lambs. Hmm, I wonder what part yours. We can't be lions until we've been, been lambs. lambs. Oh, that was weak. That sounded like a lamb. We can't be lions until we live. Right, so that, that's like there's no a crown without a cross. The highway is the low road. Or the, the greatest servant is the, the servant that's the, the least. Or uh, to be great in the kingdom of God, you have to be the servant of all. Those are things Jesus taught us. Those are things he said. And so this is the same kind of idea. We, we can't be lions until we live. You know, we need to be humble and meek and servants. And God rewards that. And, and that needs to come first. And so that's the idea. So we're going to read this together. This is from Jesus' words, Luke 17, starting at verse 7. Suppose one of you had a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. What do you say to the servant when he comes in from the field? Come along now and sit down to eat. Would he not rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready, and wait on me while I eat and drink? After that, you may eat and drink. Would he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants, we've only done our duty. We're going to look at this very closely, and we're going to pull up five stakes from it that we're going to pound into our own beliefs, into our own lives. And uh, the first of these five stakes is that th this, is, uh, this is the point. We are all God's servants. We are all God's servants. And, and, and what that means is that it's not just, oh, the pastor is the servant of the Lord. No, no, it's every believer, every follower of Jesus Christ. You need to think of yourself positionally as a servant of God. That that's who I am. That's my identity. That, that, that's, that's who I, I exist uh, because I'm a servant of the living God. Now, some people, if they read this uh, passage, uh, they might get the idea that the master is kind of mean. And read that. We're very sensitive to this these days, right? That, that uh, uh, here's the master. He doesn't even thank the servant. Man, what a cruel guy. Man, our, we, you can't judge scripture by our time and culture. You need to understand that in the first century, in that culture that Jesus is talking about, servants was a common part of society. Slaves were a common part of the society. And you treated a servant like a servant. See, today we don't even have an idea what that is. But so, so in those days, a servant was just, you did what you were supposed to do. It wasn't like today where everyone has to be thanked and stuff like that. No, no this, this was those days, those days. So what Jesus is talking about is not personal relationships. He's using this as a parable to talk about our relationship with God. Okay? He's not saying, oh, mistreat your servants. No, 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 it's not that. This is talking about God is like the master, right? And we are like the, the servants, right? So it's a, it's a teaching, of, it's a spiritual teaching. That's what parables are. They're earthly stories that have a spiritual teaching. So the teaching, and this is so obvious, but I have to say it, that we are the God's servants. We are God's servants. And I, I say this with passion because some of the teaching that I hear going around uh, America today in a lot of churches is the opposite idea. That God is your servant. Yeah, yeah, that's what I hear. It's kind of the idea that, hey, God exists in order to fulfill your wishes, in order to answer your prayers, in order to make your life better, in order to make you comfortable. I mean, you name it and claim it. Blab it and grab it. I mean, that's why God's there. He's there to make you a success and to make you happy. 
And that can come across as the idea that God is our servant. But no, get it straight. We are God's servant. And God is not our servant. We're to serve God. So we need to have that as a very clear picture in our mind. That's our position. That's our position. So back to our wonderful statement. We can't be lions until we be lions. So uh, if you have that idea uh, planted in your mind, I am a servant of God, then what should follow is the proper attitude. Okay, what should follow, and it doesn't always follow. You can say intellectually, yeah, yeah, I'm a servant. But then what should follow is the actual action, the actual attitude of servanthood. And I'm going to tell you something that is really for mature Christians, because baby Christians won't like this. But in this story, what happens is that the servant is working out in the field, right? He's doing some kind of work out in the field. He comes into the house, and then he's expected to wait on tables, right? So the idea is the end of one service is the beginning of another. And I'm talking about a relationship with God, a relationship with God. When God has a job for you, the end of one service is the beginning of another. In other words, you just keep serving. Oh, then, well, well, I'm done. I'm done. I did my job. No, no, there's another job. And there's another job after that. Now, does that mean, oh, God's so mean? Oh, it's God so mean. No, in the story, the servant does get dinner, right? It's not, you know, the servant does. But this is ordinary. This is expected of the servant that you do one job, then you do the next. And I'm just trying to, uh, to don't, don't shoot the messenger here. I'm just trying to explain what Jesus is saying, okay? This is what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying uh, that we are to be servants, and when God gives you a task, and you get done with it, you can just go on to the next task. Yeah, and then go on to the next one. Because the idea that a lot of people have is, um, hey, you know, I did a good deed. I did my good deed for the day. And if it was a really good deed, I did my good deed for the week. You know, that's how they, their attitude is. Yeah, you know, do uh, one good turn a day. You know, it, it's no, no. It's, it's not one. We're supposed to always be a servant. That's a servant attitude. Always be serving. Let me give you an illustration. It's like this. Uh, a, a mother of a, a newborn baby is on call 24-7, right? The baby needs to be fed, she feeds the baby. The baby needs to be changed, you change the baby. The baby's crying, there's some problem, you go to the baby, find out what's wrong, right? And you, you, you take care of the baby. You're taking care of the baby all the time. Versus the idea of, well, you know, I changed the baby once this week. <laughs> I fed the baby once this week. That's kind of the attitude of the young fathers, right? <laughs> That's their attitude. You know, I, I chased the baby this week. You know, now the mom, it's your turn, you do the rest. But that's also Christian attitudes. You know, hey, I did something for the Lord. You know, I, I gave some money to a poor person, or I paid some money into the offering plate. I'm done. I'm good to go. A mature Christian attitude has this, this, this uh, philosophy is that I'm on call 24-7. God, whatever you want. I'm your servant. That's the right train of thought. All right? And the right train of thought will lead you to a better station in life. All right, so then the third stake that we want to put into the ground, the third stake is that God comes before us. So in the story, you can see how the servant's working. He comes into the house, and then he's expected to serve the master's meal before his own. God comes before us. And that's, you'd say, well, that's obvious. But it's not always obvious in a lot of people's lives. So, so um, as Christians, we need to think God is the priority. God comes first. What does God want? Now, that doesn't mean that you don't ever take care of yourself. Of course, you've got to take care of yourself. You've got to get your proper sleep. You've got to get your proper uh, food. All those things, right? But what Jesus is trying to combat is the idea that God is like a side hobby. 
No, no. God is the master. God must come first. Now, I, I found this uh, interesting quote by Tommy uh, Lasorda. Tommy Lasorda was a baseball coach, quite famous. Uh, and uh, at one point, he said that his wife accused him of loving baseball more than he loved her. And this was his response. You know, honey, I think you're right. But I'll tell you, I love you more than football, and I love you more than basketball. Uh, we need to love God more than football, more than basketball, more, we need to love God more than baseball and even more than pickleball. We need to love God more than mopping and more than shopping. We need to love God more than honey and we need to love God more than money. We need to love God with all our hearts, all our soul, all our minds, and all our strength and put Him first. Amen? Amen? Amen. All right. So our phrase again is, we can't be lions until we be lions. So there's, there's another uh, stake we want to put in uh, into our tent, into our philosophy of life. And uh, this fourth one is all about uh, taking captive those prideful thoughts. We want to take captive any prideful thoughts because pride goes before a fall. God exalts the humble. Okay, so how do you know if you're getting prideful? This is a good test to know if you're getting prideful. When you do something nice, you do a service, you give your time in some way, do you need to be thanked? Now in this story, it's interesting. Because in our culture, we're all about thanks, right? Thank you, people. But in the story, it says, does the master thank the servant? No. No. Doesn't even thank him. And that's just a small indication that, that you got a little bit of pride. Hey, look at what I did. Hey, somebody should thank me. Yeah, uh, and, and, and it's like uh, the story is telling us if you have no pride in you, you just do it without expecting any thanks. You, you help people without expecting any thanks. You know, you take people to the doctor uh, and, and drive all that way through, without expecting any thanks. You volunteer at church and, and uh, do something like, a lot, a lot of you do wonderful services here. And thank you, thank you for all your help. But um, you, you do it without expecting any thanks. You just serve without expecting any thanks. And that's an attitude of humility. Uh, and, and so it's not like uh, the Pharisees who had to be uh, praised. Hey, look at me and look what I've done. You just serve. You just serve without thanks. We need this humble attitude. We need to just uh, kill those thoughts of pride. We need to cap, uh, captivate them and put them in prison because they will harm us. God uses the humble. Let me give you an example of that from the life of Moses. Now, Moses is a great character. Remember, he was born a Hebrew slave. And his mother put him in a basket because they were killing off all the boys. She put him in the basket, put him in the Nile River. A Pharaoh's daughter discovers him, adopts him. He grows up in Pharaoh's household. Now, God needed this because God needed someone who was well-educated. So he learned how to read and write. He learned all this stuff growing up in Pharaoh's household. And, and when he was 40 years old, he had all this knowledge, training, and it's natural leadership ability, right? And he's thinking, oh, I, God's going to use me to free his people. But the pride God couldn't use. When you grow up in, in Pharaoh's a family, yeah, a lot of, you're going to get a lot of pride, right? So God couldn't use him yet. So at age 40, he sees one of his Hebrew, uh, the Hebrew slaves being beaten by an Egyptian slave master. And so he kills the Egyptian, buries him. But word gets out, oh, Moses has killed this guy. And so Moses has to flee for his life. And he goes to a far off country where for the next 40 years, he's a nobody. Yeah, he marries, he has kids, but he's, he's nobody. He's a shepherd. He's not anyone important. Yeah, he's just out there just living a normal life in the, wandering the wilderness. For 40 years, it took God 40 years to teach him uh, all these uh, qualities that he needed and how to uh, relate to that culture and all these things he needed. But for the next 40 years, God needed to humble him. So he becomes very, very humble. And at age 80, God appears to him in a burning bush. And he's so humble at this point that when God says, I want you to go back and free your people from Egypt, which had been on his heart when he was younger, he's so humble by this time that he just makes excuses. 
If you read the story, he goes, oh, Lord, I can't speak. He even at one point says, oh, God, send someone else. Like, look, I'm 80. I'm tired. <laughs> and he's, that, he's so humble by that point. But God needed someone that was humble because God was going to use him to do these uh, amazing miracles. Right? I'll send all these plagues and miracle after miracle, mighty miracles. And God couldn't use a proud person to do that. God needed a humble person. And so that's, that, that was his attitude. That's the attitude of Jesus. Remember when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane. And, and he's, he knows what's coming. He knows the cross and torture is coming. But he prays, Father, Abba, Father, not my will be done, but your will. Jesus was the ultimate lamb. And, and, and just like Moses, you need to be humbled before, that's a prerequisite, before you can be empowered by God to do great things. And so we go back to this, we can't be lions until we be lions. All right, um, uh, probably, yeah, we, I just talked about this, Pray for Pope. This is a good uh, quote from Rick Warren I thought was kind of funny. Uh, we are like a whale. When you are near the top and ready to blow, and that's when you get harpooned. <laughs> that's pride, you know? We're right near the top. I'm about to, hey, look at me, and uh, watch out, yeah. Because uh, that's when uh, pride makes you fall. But the humble are the people that God exalts. So we can't be lions until we can be lions. All right, so the fifth point here is the, uh, the last part of this story. Uh, if we obey God, we have only done our duty. So, yes, we are uh, un under orders. And so the, the servants, they've done all that they're supposed to do. They've served the tables. They've worked outside. Uh, they're sitting down to their meal. And this is another good sign that if someone does compliment you, if someone does thank you, and say, wow, you did a great service you know, for God. You really helped that person. Well, that's so great. How, what should your response be? We have our position, we have our attitude, but then what should our ultimate response be after it's all done? Oh, it was nothing. I didn't do anything special. It was all normal. That's just, that's normal. That's just what I'm supposed to do. Even our great works, and you know, sometimes we go on mission trips, and I think, well, can they look at what I did. You know, I did this mission trip for the Lord. Even that, we need to view it as, you just did what you're supposed to do. It's, just, it's normal. That's just what I'm supposed to do. And, and so this is a, this is like our duty, our, our duty. But I don't like to view it as a duty. Now that's, that's a good lesson. Okay, that's something we're supposed to think in our minds. This is my duty. I'm just doing what I'm supposed to do. But I would prefer to view it as, as a response to a loving relationship. We serve God because we love Him. That, that should be the, the real reason. It, it's like, um, I'm going to use my, my relationship with my wife as an example. All right, so... So I, uh, it's not a written code, it's like unofficial duty that she cooks and I set the table and clean up afterwards, right? So I clean up afterwards. But am I, is this my duty? I'm setting the table, I'm cleaning up afterwards. And, and sometimes, you know, the, the car needs the oil change. So I'll take the car and have the oil change in her car. Now, is that my duty? Do I go, with oh, this is my duty, I've got to get this done. No, I'm so happy to do that because I love her. I absolutely adore her. We have a great relationship. And because of that relationship, it's not a burden. It's not a duty. It's just living together, helping each other out. And I, I want to see her blessed, and I want to see her happy. And so, yeah, I'm happy to do these things. And that should be our attitude toward God. Because we love Him so much. Because we have this wonderful relationship with Him, and we're so grateful to Him. We are happy to serve Him. We're happy to do it. And that should be the kind of attitude that, that we have. It's not that like, we've done our duty, but hey, it was nothing because I love you, God, and I'll, I'll continue to serve you. All right, so um, Jesus tells this story with spiritual principles, and we've just heard the five uh, stakes that we need to put down. Uh, but I want to end with a, with a fairy tale. One of the best ways to explain a parable is with another parable. So this is a, uh, a story that explains Jesus' story uh, in a slightly different way, but it's the same point. And I love this story. I came across it years ago, and, and it's, the, it's the fable of Victor. All right? So uh, this is a made-up story, but uh, the point's really good. So there was this young woman who was married, 
and she got pregnant, and then her husband died in a tragic accident a month before the baby was born. So the husband's dead, there's this young widow with her newborn baby, and the, the people are friends, and the neighbors around her is, uh, in, a, in, a, in a village, um, they are just feeling so bad, she's going to have to raise this child on her own. And so they throw a baby shower, and they bring her all kinds of gifts. They bring her a crib, and some toys, and clothes, and, and food, and different things. And they're really trying to comfort her, and she says, I thank you so much. You've all been so kind at this very difficult time. And after they've all left, there's this one kind of uh, gentleman that's been off by himself. He's kind of a strange guy. He lives in the village. He knows her. On occasion, they've met. But she doesn't know much about him. Everyone thinks he's kind of weird. But he comes to the door and he knocks on the door. Everyone's gone. And she opens the door and, and he says, I brought you a gift as well for your young child, who she names Victor after his father. And he says, but my gift is unlike all the others. What I'm going to give you is one wish. Wish anything for your child. And I have the power to fulfill it. Now she thinks that's strange. He says, you need to decide this before midnight tomorrow. And then he gracefully uh, uh, greets her and, and leaves. And so she's thinking about it all day long, thinking about, what do I want? What do I want for my, for my baby here, for Victor? And right before midnight, she comes up with the idea, and she says, I wish that everyone in the world will love Victor. I wish that everyone in the world will love Victor. And sure enough, it happens. The wish is fulfilled. And as Victor starts growing up, everyone loves him. Everyone adores him. As a baby, he's just brought all kinds of gifts, and people are just enamored with him. And as he's a young boy, they just think, oh, he's so wonderful, and he can do no wrong. And when he does wrong, nobody punishes him because they just love him so much. Oh, no, no, kid, Victor's such a great good kid. He's so nice. We just love Victor. And so they don't punish him, and so it, it, it does bad for him because he starts getting away with stuff. And he gets worse and worse. He starts taking advantage of people. And it gets worse in junior high. It gets worse in high school. Pretty soon he's just taking advantage of her. All these girls just flock to him. They just love him. They're just attracted to him. They love him. And he takes advantage of that. And he gets into a lot of sinful behavior. And he gets a fry. Go to college for free. We give you a full ride scholarship. And he goes to college. And he, and he said, takes advantage of everybody. And he just he comes back uh, the first Christmas vacation from college with a brand new car that someone just gave him. And all these clothes that people just gave him. And all this money. And he doesn't spend any time with his mom. He just goes off getting drunk and partying. And he's surrounded by all kinds of friends because they all love him. And he just goes worse and worse. There is no vice he does not engage in. There's no pleasure he doesn't try. He tries everything. And it gets worse and worse and worse. And he has all that he could want. But he's miserable inside. He's absolutely miserable. He's a young man. And he decides, this is, this is horrible. I want to get away from everything and everybody. And he goes camping. He goes camping. He goes out by himself into, uh, in, into the, the woods and starts camping. He makes a campfire. And he's brought with him some poison. He thinks about it all one day, and then the second day, he takes that poison, and he pours it into his beer, and he's going he's gonna to kill himself, because he's absolutely miserable inside. And right before he drinks it, that man, who everyone would call, he was not a doctor, but they all called him Doc Burns, the man who offered the wish originally to his mother, somehow finds out where he is, somehow knows what he's going to do. And, and the doc shows up at that campsite. And he comes over and he says, wait, wait, wait. Let me explain. Because I think the situation you're in is my fault. Your mother made a foolish wish and I granted it. And he explains the whole story. He explains what it, uh, he was wished and what's happened to him and how then it's affected him. And he tells him the whole thing. And he says, I tell you what, I'm going to grant you one more wish and will undo the other wish if you want. Think about it. And the guy says, I have everything that I could ever wish for, and it's brought me misery. I have nothing that you could ever offer. And the man, Doc Burns, he says, no, no, think again. Your mother wished that everyone would love you. What can you wish for? Think about it. What would actually help you? 
And for the first time in many, many years, the man got serious and actually thought. And he thought through everything that he'd been told. And he finally comes up and he says, okay, let's undo the magic that everyone will love me. And instead of that, give me the power to love everyone. And he says, you've made a wise choice. That's a good wish and it will be granted to you. And from that moment on, things changed in his mind and in his heart. And he had this love for everyone around him. You think things would get better. Well, they did not at first. So he goes back to society and all of his friends who had loved him, they don't love him anymore. They abandoned him. He has no friends anymore. All the people that he'd hurt and done mean things to him, they take revenge on him. And they wipe out this from him. He has no more money. And then those people charge him with the crimes. He had to spend six months in jail for crimes he'd gotten away with before. But they came forth and they said, no, no. And so he spent time in jail. And when he gets out of jail, he's broke. He has no friends. He's, he's just uh, going, what do I do? And he goes home and his mom's sick. But for the first time in his life, he has a love for his mom. That's like amazing. And he says, Mom, wow, all you've done for me. And so he starts caring for her and he nurses her back to health. And she gets back to health and when she's back strong enough, he goes looking for a job. And he has no skills because he never worked, but he gets a job as a janitor in a school. It was a perfect place for him. Because he has this amazing love and his kindness that's going out to everyone. And all these kids, he's just kind. He doesn't just clean the school. He's kind to everybody in the school. He's kind and, and loving and caring, especially those that are hurting, especially those that are, that are handicapped, especially those that are poor. He cares for them and he loves them. And in time, he builds up this wonderful reputation of being the most loving person in the school. And in time, he, he, he finds and meets this this uh, widow has two young children, and she, her husband has died, but he was very abusive. So she's been so wounded and so hurt, and so have her children. And her, he just has a love for her, and a love for these kids, and they get married. And he pours out the love that they really need. And these children experience the love of a father that they really needed. And they, the, 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 the wife then is just loved and cared for, and it becomes a wonderful family. And over time, as he loves people, they love him back. And he, he develops more true friends than he ever had before. And when he comes to the end of his life, he looks back and he says, wow, it really is more blessed to give than to receive. It's, it's more blessed to give out love than to receive love. Because even Jesus said, that he had come not to be served, but to serve. For it's nice to be important, but it's more important to be nice. That all ties back into our theme. We can't be lions until we are lions.